Welcome to the Breaking Into Finance podcast. My name is Craig Thompson, and this is the open source field guide to help you understand everything you need to know about breaking into finance. Let's dive in. Hey, everybody. I am thrilled to be back from a recent two-day visit to my alma mater to Middlebury College, where I had the pleasure of being able to give a number of guest lectures on campus, as well as connect through a number of one-on-one interviews, and even just kind of talk broadly. Uh, the, The college was nice enough to give me a session to basically talk a little bit about breaking into finance in kind of an unstructured hour and a half format. And I loved this trip. It was so personally fulfilling and deeply enriching, and I hope it was a great experience for the students as well. And one of the ways in which I was particularly pleased by this experience was that it really gave me a chance to connect with a lot of students who've been listening to the podcast in a lot of cases, um, who were kind of at various stages in the breaking into finance process. I spoke with everyone ranging from freshmen all the way up through seniors who are about to graduate, and everybody had lots of different topics on their mind. And so I actually got you know some great ideas for a number of episodes that we're going to do in the coming weeks. But today, I just wanted to round out this experience, just kind of debriefing with all the listeners here on the top five questions that I received over the course of those two days. Now, I do a lot of these speaking engagements. I try to spend as much time as I can talking to students in various contexts, but it is rare that I'm able to go on person to campus for a format like that. And so this is, you know, the sample size on this is in the hundreds of students that that I spoke with and interacted with. And so these top five questions, I hope give people a really good sense of what's top of mind for folks. And, you know, to the extent that a lot of people are thinking about these, I hope that this is a helpful framing and way of thinking about some of these. So without further ado, top five questions I got on my trip to Middlebury. Number one is bulge bracket banks versus boutiques, how to think about the pros and cons of each. And I love this question because when I was back in undergrad, I honestly didn't know nearly as much as I should about the difference between these two. For me, it was just kind of, you know, brand familiarity and name recognition. And there were things that I, you know, I had heard of or hadn't heard of. And let's just start with what's the difference between these two. So the biggest difference between a boutique and a bulge bracket bank is just their size. Bulge bracket banks, as you might be able to infer by, by the name kind of bulge bracket, is that they have a lot of different divisions. And just as importantly, they have a lot of capital that they can put to work. So when you think about banking, banks really do two things for their clients. One is access to capital. So basically helping them, you know, get money for whatever purpose um, they want. And in some cases, banks will directly lend to companies. So sometimes it's, you know, direct lending, direct capital. And other times it's a bank advising a company on how to go find that capital from investors. And then that gets to the other main component of investment banking is advice. And the core thing that everybody loves to talk about, like the main advisory topic is on mergers and acquisitions and investing in part because a very important skill that a lot of analysts hope to learn through the investment banking experience is modeling and specifically valuation modeling. So if you were at a bulge bracket bank, first off, If you're in investment banking at a bulge bracket, there are a lot more things that you could be doing um, because they have this whole financing group, this whole capital markets function that is focused on the capital side of this equation in addition to the advisory side. So they have both. At boutiques, you might see some that are doing some of this advisory and lending and capital markets, but predominantly they work on the advisory side. So that is the biggest difference. Number one is just the breadth and scale. And number two is that these boutique banks are spending a lot more time providing advisory and they try to emphasize as much as they can earning fees for their advice. Whereas some of these bulge bracket banks are okay giving a little bit more kind of free advice on a variety of strategic topics in exchange for sort of this 
you know, informal expectation that they will continue to get capital markets business and not just getting paid for their strategic advice. So boutique banks have this incentive to always be earning fees for their advice because they're not earning fees on capital placement in quite the same way that if you work at a big bank, um, you might be okay giving away some free advice um, and building relationships with those clients so that when those clients are ready to borrow some money via debt, if they're a private company, you know, when they're thinking about going public through an IPO um, or any of a variety of other capital markets, functions and activities that a company might be pursuing, building that relationship might lead to more fees. Um, so that is kind of the biggest practical difference between those two. But what does that mean for you? As someone who's evaluating, let's say, you know, a very elite uh, boutique bank against kind of an elite bulge bracket bank, the biggest thing to keep in mind is that at the boutique, a lot more of your work might cater to more of those, you know, merger and acquisition advisory work, kind of like fee producing work. Whereas at the bulge bracket, that's going to be a lot of what you're doing still. It's going to be a vast majority of what you're doing. Trust me, don't worry about a lack of opportunity to work on you know, your modeling skills. There's going to be plenty. But you might be doing some other stuff too. And on the one hand, that might mean that you're spending a little bit less time building these modeling skills that are in such high demand and such high value for kind of what comes next. On the other hand, you get exposure to a broader set of strategic finance topics that CFOs and CEOs are thinking about. So I wouldn't think of this as just one being better than the other. They are a little bit different. And the punchline for folks who are saying, hey, I'm you know, focused on at least a couple years of investment banking before going on to do the next thing. All I'll say is either of them are great options and there's no wrong pick here. Top of mind topic, top question asked on my Middlebury trip number four. It's basically what is the best cadence or style of outreach for networking? And the example um, that, that I got given a lot was, you know, hey, you know, through one channel or another, I met with this professional. We started emailing back and forth. We had a good conversation, but now it's been six months and I don't know if it's awkward to reach back out to them or not, if that's something I should be doing. And first off, yes, you should reach out. I, I would basically think of any successful outreach that led to a productive conversation as an open channel and an open bridge that is always there for you. The main thing I would say, though, is if you're going to reach back out, try to have a reason for it. Don't just be like, hey, like, we haven't spoken in a few months, like, was thinking of you, right? Because that's not helpful. There's no action there. So the main thing I'll encourage you to do is have some goal or target in mind. And it's, you know, in some ways it sounds weird to like have an ulterior motive when you're reaching out, but I think it's totally fine to do. And by the way, if you're just, you know, saying reconnecting, saying hi, you know, I as the banker who's receiving this email might be like, well, what, why are you sending this? Like, what, what is there for me to do? I think people at this stage really actually don't mind the ulterior motive. As long as, you know, one other thing that I'd encourage you to do is provide a little life update. Um, and it doesn't have to be your full life story. It doesn't have to be huge detail. But let's say this is connecting with someone who you met um, maybe in the spring before you went off to do an internship. And now you've come back to school in the fall. You're ready to recruit for you know, a full-time position or another internship for the following summer. And I think it's great to be like, hey, I'm not sure if you remember me, but we met at this event in the spring. We had a great conversation about X and just wanted to provide the update that over the summer I did this opportunity, learned about these set of things, and I continue to be really interested about pursuing a career at your firm in your group and just wanted to see if you had time to reconnect. And look, there's a chance that they might say, hey, I'm busy, but, um, you know, noted is I remember meeting you and, you know, talk to this other person or and I'll put your hat in the ring or I'll put in a good word for you or something. So a lot of those kind of circling back outreaches, I know for a lot of people, it can feel 
weird or awkward to be circling back with an ulterior motive like that. But as long as you're cordial, you're polite, you give context for what you're hoping for, I think in a lot of ways people expect that ask. So you shouldn't feel nervous or awkward about putting it out there. And it's also worth noting that the ask that you have is not, hey, can you give me a job? Can you get me this internship? Because one, they probably can't single-handedly. Um, it is on you at the end of the day. But two, that kind of pushes a lot on them. But your ask is really, hey, in the context of me applying now, I wanted to see if you had time for another call um, or could provide any advice around the process. Um, I think kind of any of those types of topics or questions is fair game. It's great to do. Top question number three, and I love this one, is basically how to learn the technicals said in a variety of ways. And um, part one of that answer is, is the podcast, is breaking into finance. I, I hope you'll, you know, if you're listening to some of these interviews and some of these more recent episodes, I hope that you'll go back and listen to all of the episodes that are labeled technicals. I actually just went through recently and tried to relabel a lot of the episode titles in the hopes of making them easier to scan and kind of see what's there. Um, so listening to the pod and watching all of our YouTube content are kind of two things you can do. Um, another thing I'd recommend is find some friends and work on studying together, work on practicing together. And then one other thing I'll recommend is that if there is a full-time analyst that you're friendly with, someone who maybe has given you coaching advice before, um, someone that you've spoken with before, don't be afraid to ask them if you can take five minutes um, you know, or 10 minutes on a call to kind of walk through a mock analysis that you've done. Now, I know it might feel a little strange. It might feel a little awkward to be, you know, doing this kind of verbal no slides review of analysis that you're doing or something that you're practicing, um, where it might have been something that for a student club or presentation, you put together like a 15 page PowerPoint deck and you like built a full model. But guess what? When you're in your interviews in your super day, nobody's going to give you a PowerPoint to walk in with, right? It's up to you to kind of provide that succinct verbal analysis overview of what you did and describe it eloquently enough to impress whoever your interviewer is. So I actually do view this as a really nice thing that you can try to do with analysts because one, it's great practice for you. You'll get immediate actionable feedback, and it's great real interview practice. So don't sleep on that as, as something to do. Top question that I got, um, number two, is on the job or during the internship, kind of how to act and comport yourself. Are there any etiquette concerns that, that I should be thinking about? And then related to that is how do people evaluate interns? And so the first thing I'll say just, just to get it out there is be yourself. And I say that in part because everybody deals with imposter syndrome to some, to some extent in this. Some of that is because there is a little bit of a cultural fake it till you make it in this industry. Just the jargon is so dense and there is such a big learning curve when you step into these types of institutions that it can feel kind of overbearing. But if you really take that fake it till you make it to heart and you find yourself not asking questions that you might have or trying to invent how you think you're comporting yourself without you know level setting or you know talking about it first one it'll be really de-energizing for you like it just consumes a lot of energy to be someone you're not and two people got to know you through the interview process and people liked you and hired you for you so I really would encourage everyone to bring your full self to work. And look, when you step in, like you'll learn at your particular firm things like what the dress code etiquette is on the weekends. Um, you know, you might come in a little bit more dressed up during the week. You might come in, you know, dressed up, especially if, um, you know, a lot of the partners in the office or if you're going to a client meeting, you know, you should wear a suit. But on weekends, you know, depending on the firm, depending on the group. I think it's very likely that jeans and a, you know, a t-shirt without any, you know, big writing on it is like a perfectly reasonable thing to wear on a Sunday. Um, 
So these are also great questions to ask too. Um, not during the interview process, but maybe in the week or two leading up to it. It's okay to kind of, if you know other people who are interning, if you know people that were there the summer before, um, you know, just get some of these stupid questions out of the way. And we actually have some great episodes on this too. So I think it's episode 41 is an interview I did with Chandler Dula, just talking about a little bit of the nitty gritty of the, you know, the summer process and some of all of the things around summer housing and budget and all that stuff. So I encourage you to check that out as well. Last question, and I, I love this question because this gets at one of the things that I was excited to be on campus for and provide some insight that maybe some alumni who come to campus for campus recruiting maybe wouldn't or can't or might not dire directly answer it in the same way, which is tell me about exit opportunities. Tell me about, you know, if I get this job, what can I do next? Or if I'm weighing two different jobs, how do I know which one has the better exit opportunities? Even if I want to stay at the firm for a while, I just like knowing, you know, that that optionality exists. And I want to say there is a lot of ground to cover on this. And I actually want to talk about two things in this segment. The first is that I want to talk about kind of ways of thinking about skill sets that you'll build as a way of prioritizing, you know, across different groups, across different firms, across different cities. Are there particular skills that you should be looking to add now? And how does the market value those skills? So first off, when you're thinking about exit opportunities, there are plenty of exit opportunities for, you know, literally any of these. I mean, you are so early in your career that, you know, in the absolute worst case, one exit opportunity that is always available to everyone at any time after a couple of years of experience is to take the GMAT or take the GRE and apply to business school. Um, there is no business school that will say, oh, you did, you know, this thing, like pass, like you're, you're out. Um, if your scores are high enough and if you performed well enough at whatever function you were focused on, as long as you have an eye towards upward mobility and continuing to grow your career, you shouldn't feel that any of those doors are closed to you. Um, so that's the first thing. Now, in terms of skill sets, how do you prioritize the most value added skills? And let's just start at a base level, even before you started your first full-time job, let's say you're, you know, you're trying to break into an internship or you're trying to do well at an internship, the two most important skills that you should be building at this stage in your career before your first job, and even during the first job, but you can even start doing this a lot earlier, is one, attention to detail, and two, is jargon. So let's unpack each of those. Attention to detail means that, you know, if you are working on a pitch for a student investment club, if you're writing a paper, if you're doing a take home exam, attention to detail correlates really highly to grades and a GPA because, you know, you could be insanely smart and, you know, and have a GPA that doesn't, you know, quite reflect that or isn't a 4.0. Um, but if you have a 4.0 GPA, one, you're probably pretty smart. Um, but there are people who work really, really, really hard and can get that top GPA without necessarily being the, you know, most brilliant top of the class, but still very smart. And so I think that is one reason why employers are so focused on GPA is that GPA is very highly correlated with intelligence, yes. And where you go to school, you know, you could, you know, debate that honestly, like a lot. Um, but I think people view it as a proxy for some of those things. But the real thing that a top notch GPA shows is that you have attention to detail. It shows that you know the difference between an A minus and an A, or an A and an A plus, and you can go that extra mile and you know how to do that. So attention to detail is so critical in these roles because a lot of what you're doing is, you know, focused on every 
pixel of a PowerPoint presentation or every cell of, of an Excel model. And so that attention to detail is the basis for all of this stuff. The other thing that's the basis for all this stuff is jargon, is learning all of these technicals, knowing the difference between you know, operating profit and EBITDA, knowing the difference between net sales and revenue, um, you know, or even if there is a difference in some cases. It's knowing how to build a fully flowing three-statement financial model. It's knowing the difference between levered and unlevered free cash flow. All of these are topics that we talk about here on the podcast because I want you to feel comfortable with this language. And if you have those two things, if you have attention to detail and you have jargon, I guarantee that you are in such a strong position for whoever give you, gives you a chance first. And whatever interviews, networking, super days, if you have great attention to detail and you're learning this jargon and you're starting to really get it, I promise you that you will get that internship, you'll get that job. So let's say you've got the job now, like you've gotten that, you know, you're, you're an analyst now, like what is the highest value skill that you could be building at this stage in your career? And again, there are really two things. One, I'll just call it professionalism. When you work at some of these really large, successful institutions, you just get a sense through osmosis of how do people comport themselves? How do the VPs and MDs and partners that you work with, how, how do they prioritize the client experience? How do they think about presenting persuasive evidence of whatever advice they're seeking to give? How are they navigating challenges or difficult conversations? If there are any dilemmas or questions, how are they escalating those questions or addressing them as need be? How is just the firm running? How are different teams interacting with one another? How are people reviewed and evaluated? All of these things, just being in a high-performing firm literally doesn't matter what function. As long as you're just in that firm, you'll get to feel a lot of this. Um, so that professionalism, really any job um, within the same firm, you'll get access to a lot of that stuff. Um, and so here you're really prioritizing, like this is where people talk about like firm pedigree or anything like that. Like pretty much all of these places that you can apply will have really high quality professionalism. But I think that's something that people really value out of the traditional investment banking experience over going to work for a smaller firm where, um, you know, it's not to say that the, the folks there might be less professional, but they might have less of a track record of really coaching you up and, and giving you a lot of opportunities to see all of this in action. So that's number one. And number two, and this is like the most highly valued skill, um, probably at any point in terms of like a ratchet up or down um, to your career trajectory is modeling. And when I say modeling, I'm talking very specifically about company valuation modeling. It's basically taking a company that does a bunch of stuff and having all of the Excel skills to go and you know build a really complicated model, a really dense model, and come up with ways of valuing that business. Why is modeling so important? Well, first off, it's worth noting that 30 years into your career, you likely will not be doing any modeling. Um, you, you won't be the one in Excel. You won't even be the one who's looking over the shoulder of the one doing Excel. Um, so this isn't necessarily that lifelong thing that's valuable. Um, but this is what gets your foot in the door. Because a lot of these super sophisticated, super smart investors and advisors are, you know, they really don't want to be the ones running these Excel models. Um, your excuse and your way to get into the room with these folks, see them at their best, see them in action, learn from their professionalism, from their judgment. Um, if you're looking to be in investment banking long-term to learn from you know, how they build client relationships and manage those client relationships. If you wanna be in the room, you need to bring something to the table. And especially at this stage in your career, 
being a top-notch financial modeler, basically leveraging that attention to detail and that jargon to build a lot of models, and then building down that modeling experience to become even better and better at it, and more of a trusted member of the team in that regard, that's what's going to separate you. That's what's going to that's what's going to help you stand apart. And for folks who hear about, you know, whoever it is, you know, getting these private equity, these like crazy private equity offers or hedge fund offers, um, you know, when they're only even a couple weeks or a couple months into their investment banking career for jobs that won't start for two years or more, um, the skill that is getting prioritized there is your modeling. And if you want to go into private equity, it's the LBO model, the leverage buyout model. If you're going into hedge funds, um, then there are versions of different valuation models that they'll care about. Um, but for public companies, you know, it'll just be like, you know, super quick, you know, DCFs or there's some kind of like alternative data analyses that people are do. There's kind of entry exit multiple analyses in comparison of comps that people will do. Um, and so all of those are, are fair game there. So now you're, you know, anywhere from one to three years into your career, you got the attention to detail, you got the jargon, you got the modeling, you got the professionalism, what's next? And this is the number one thing that starts to help people separate from being kind of more junior resources to more mid-level resources at their firm. And one of those things is process understanding, especially in private equity and investment banking, the kind of like M&A process and understanding how like all of the steps of an auction when a company is up for sale and trying to get acquired, um, or if you're the buyer and you are trying to acquire a particular company, really being able to master and understand the steps of that process and the negotiation tactics that come into play the cadence of management presentations and, and styles of delivering information and managing those due diligence processes, that is all super critical. The other thing that you're starting to learn, you're starting to get better at, is investment judgment. Investment judgment in particular is something that, in my experience, really distinguishes the private equity experience or really any sort of investing experience, whether it's venture or hedge funds, from the advisory experience, whether it's banking or consulting. And this starts to help you learn how to underwrite something. Underwriting is effectively taking a position that is not just, is this defensible? But, you know, would you put your dollars behind it? Like, would you put your own money on the line betting on this thing being true? And so, like, one analogy I like to think about, you know, when we're talking about this stuff is the difference between what you know talking heads on TV might say, um, whether it's on CNN or ESPN or you know name your channel, um, when there are commentators who are saying things that you know sometimes they're trying to say stuff that's a little inflammatory, but usually they are trying to say something that could be true, or there are kind of these debates that go on. But frequently there is a level of distinction between the level of discussion that they're having and the discussion that the practitioners are having. Um, so whether those are, you know, cabinet members in the CNN example, and maybe like they have a very different insider perspective than the CNN commentators or general managers in kind of the sports context. Um, so really building that investment judgment is, you know, one very important, very critical part to sort of those um, mid-stage kind of developing roles. And as you're building your modeling skills, as you're building your investment judgment, the last two things, and this is basically later on in your career, I don't care you know, whether you're you know, in the C-suite at a company, whether you are a professional investor, whether you are an investment banker, whether you are a lawyer, kind of no, ma no matter what you're doing um, in, in your career, the, the final two pieces of the puzzle that you'll be putting together are one, your network. Who you know and who trusts you and likes you, that's who can be resources for you for inside information. And I don't mean inside information like 
insider trading and kind of like the illegal um, public market context. I mean, there's just a lot of information in the world. Like maybe you're thinking about investing in a company and you don't know if you like the CEO. You don't know if they're a capable CEO. And maybe you know somebody who knows somebody who worked with that CEO, you know, in their last job or two jobs ago, and you can go find them and talk to them and get a little bit more of a, you know, unfiltered breakdown on their performance. Sometimes you might be looking to find a new deal or find a new client, and there's a relationship that leads you to basically find a company that nobody else, you know, at, at that institutional investor stage knows about or is thinking about. So there are a ton of advantages to having a deep and trusted network. And by the way, that's a big reason why a lot of people go to business school. Sure, there are elements of kind of like this high status vacation element of, you know, people who are maybe a little burnt out and want to break, but the real return on investment of going to business school, especially if you started in banking, it's less the education and it's much more the network. And so when if you're thinking about going to business school and you're in your mid or your late 20s, you shouldn't be running an analysis that says like, what's the three year return on investment? You know, like what's my ROI in year three after this? And if it's not positive, then I'm not going. Don't think about it that way. The way to think about the long-term value of pursuing an MBA is that you know, I can't tell you when it will be, but I can tell you that at least once, if not, you know, two times or, or four times, you will get access to a job or a deal, or you will learn something that causes you to invest or not invest and avoid investing in a deal that more than returns the tuition um, you know, and the opportunity cost of, of going. So I don't know when over your 20 year career or 30 year or 40 year career that'll happen, but I can promise that it will. So that's the network. And then the other thing is sales and sales is a skill. It's not something that, you know, people are just inherently born being, you know, great salespeople, but being able to build coalitions and, you know, get that kind of thought leadership, get that trust of folks, getting people to give you your business, getting people to give you their capital, getting people to trust you as the go-to advisor for advice and being willing to pay you for that advice. Sales is at the center of all of this. And at the partner level, you know, across banks everywhere, like the the way you're going to get compensated and the way you're going to continue to move up in the ranks are how good and how strong are your relationships? How trusted are you as an advisor? And how good are you at converting that trust and that network into dollars for the firm? Um, so sales, network, the two most critical things at the senior level kind of across every you know facet of, of business and finance. And so that is my breakdown of when you think about exit opportunities, when you think about evaluating a job, think about it in that context. If you're early in your career, you should be asking, is this a way to show off my attention to detail and my understanding of the jargon in a way that will allow me to learn modeling and professionalism? Next, if you're a great modeler and you're, you know, you've gained you know, some of this professionalism, are you going after a job that will teach you that investment judgment? And if you have that investment judgment and now you're kind of building all of those skills and you're evaluating, you know, moving up, getting promoted, doing a lateral transfer, are you leveraging your investment judgment? Are you putting yourself out there and are you doing all the things that you need to do to build that thought leadership, broaden your network? and put yourself in a position where you've practiced kind of, you know, getting money or getting capital or, you know, getting dollars for your advice or kind of whatever the thing is and getting those sales. Because by the way, even if you're at a hedge fund, even if you're in private equity and you're thinking, hey, all I am is a deals person, like I just want to do deals and get strong returns. Well, I'll tell you what, sure, that performance is part of the compensation 
and part of the way you make money, but the other real way you make money is by managing a lot of money. It's it's through that AUM. And so if you're the one who can go out to LPs and get them to commit to you over all the other funds, I actually think that that skill, that sales skill is even more valued in the market than just the kind of single-minded deal making. Um, so this is this is my quick debrief on some of the top questions I heard in my two days back at Middlebury. There's a lot of other uh, great questions that came up. I think a couple include, you know, to MBA or not MBA, kind of like how to think about whether people should plan for business school. People asked a lot of great questions about breaking down all of the areas of the big banks, spending a little bit more time talking about the differences between the kind of classic or coverage side of investment banking and the financing group or the capital markets teams. And so we're going to talk about all of those things and more in future episodes. Um, but I hope this was helpful. Please leave any questions or comments um, you know, in the chat or feel free to reach out to me. And with that, I hope you have a great rest of your day. That does it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. And remember to check out our website, breakingintofinancepodcast.com, where you can submit questions, join our Substack to stay up to date on new content releases, and much, much more. We'll see you next time.